The book Boundaries of the Educational Imagination is really about trying to extend your thinking and your ability to see how education works in all its wonderful complexity across all sorts of different dimensions. Now, in the third chapter, which is the previous video, we took a look at the brain and there we found that you can expand outwards from the smallest and most limited space of working memory, which can only hold three or four things in place for around about 10 to 15 seconds and how from that very limited space you could expand outwards into the infinite space of long-term memory and the systematic and network knowledge structures it provides. Now we're going to shift from the brain into the mind, into how we are inside ourselves in this fourth video. And I've called it from babe to sage. And really what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and capture the full range of human development all the way from when we are babies crawling around trying to make sense of just the basics of our own bodies and existence through to where we become increasingly profoundly understanding and experiential about the nature of this world and participate in it and the role that education plays in this process. So let's get going with the account and let's start off with a, a space where uh, a lot of us are familiar with and that is Maslow's hierarchy of needs because he's a very interesting guy in terms of his discoveries of how human development actually proceeds. Now we know that he had a basic argument that uh, you have a hierarchical structure where the later needs can only be really possible uh, once you fulfill the earlier needs. So for example it's only once you've got your biological and physiological needs to do with air, food, drink, shelter, warmth, sleep, sex kind of sorted that you can begin to look higher up at uh, more profound needs. And Maslow moved from biological and physiological needs to safety needs, the basics of law and order, to once that's sorted, being able to feel belongingness and love uh, in your relationships with your family. And once you've got a base of love settled and sorted, your esteem needs can arise where you start to look for achievement and status and responsibility. And with those needs kind of cared for, you can really begin the search for knowledge, meaning and self-awareness. And from that, you can shift upwards from that into aesthetic needs, uh, where you begin to sense the need for beauty and balance to your life. And you start to try to become a complete and a whole person in, in your own right. And what's fascinating about that is he then uh, moved on to self-actualization and for a long time Maslow thought that self-actualization was the highest need that you had where you really strive for um, self-actualization, personal growth and self-fulfillment. But let's check uh, what it means to self-actualize and what I've done is I've designed it as a quiz and let's see how you do in the quiz in terms of how far up you're in the needs and whether you've actually hit self-actualization in your own terms. Um, so here's a question. Do you work with reality the way it is or do you fight for your version of reality? Uh, secondly, do you do what feels good and natural for you or do you do what others expect of you and then pretend that it's actually your own initiative, that actually it is natural for you, even though you're doing what others expect of you? Now, you can very clearly see which answers are correct here, uh, but it still gives you a, a nice way to actually get a sense of what it means to self-actualize. Uh, number three, are you focused on the problems of society and other people or are you focused on your own problems, but tell yourself they are of great importance to the world? Do you enjoy sometimes solitude, privacy and self-reflection? Or do you keep the TV on for company, have lots of friends around most of the time? In fact, almost all the time you feel terrible if they're not around. Uh, do you feel that all of your 500 Facebook friends really are your friends? It's quite interesting about self-actualization uh, in terms of the research Maslow did not and he showed that uh, people who self-actualizing have fewer friends, but the friendships that they have are very intense uh, and fulfilling. 
Let's kind of get some other descriptions going. Are you comfortable in silence with friends? Or do you continually feel the need to fill space with your wit, wisdom and gossip? Do you enjoy playing games as you did as a child? Or are you happy to leave the children doing their own thing whilst you drink beer and watch sport? Or, if you're a woman, do you resent the men drinking beer and watching sport? Do you celebrate deep and profound experiences when they do come along? Or... Do you deny any knowledge of such experiences or laugh dismissively at such accounts, kind of poo-poo them, uh, mock them, uh, kind of tease the people who have those accounts? Do you feel in tune with reality or must reality tune into your wavelength? And do you have deep and meaningful relationships with few people or are you known to be a bit of a slag or a bastard or suspected at least of having some kind of tendency like that? And uh, is your sense of humor philosophical, unhostile, and good-natured, or is it sarcastic and crude? And judging from the way I set up uh, this little quiz, I suspect uh, my sense of humor slightly falls into the second grouping over there. Um, now, really, uh, obviously, all the A's were people who are uh, working in a self-actualized way, by Maslow's definition, and all the people who were in the D category were kind of striving to get towards that level. Now, as Maslow kind of reached closer to his own death and old age, what happened was he began to realize that people actually got beyond self-actualization. When they'd got to a point where they'd fulfilled themselves, really the question became of transcending yourself, of reaching beyond yourself. And it's this zone that I want to move into for the rest of the video, really because this is about shifting the boundaries outwards, shifting how our educational imaginations work in terms of education, not just to the level where we try to get a rational citizen operating in the world, which is really uh, the big goal of education, but to say, how does education reach even those far profounder, more transcendent levels of education? What do those look like and how do we actually teach those things? So uh, what Maslow began to recognize was the fact that self-transcenders worked in these kinds of characteristic ways. And the first thing he began to identify was that they speak easily, normally, naturally and unconsciously the language of being, the language of poets, of mystics, of seers, of profoundly religious men. And, and when they did it, it came out in everyday terms with everyday people and uh, was recognized as actually being in context. Uh, you're not suddenly sprouting forth uh, in some weird context about it. It was a very lived, easy way that they actually conducted their, their lives. They tended to see the sacredness in all things uh, at the same time that they also see uh, the sacredness at the practical everyday level. So there's this tendency to live your life in a transcendent way, even though your activities are small and practical and everyday. There's a profoundness to those kinds of activities for these people. And when they see someone else who's, who's like themselves, there seems to be an almost instant intimacy and mutual understanding that comes upon first meetings. And, you know, I suppose a, a good example of this would be the Dalai Lama on the one side and old Tutu on the other side, immediately finding each other as soulmates uh, because they can actually see each other's souls. Um, there's a situation where they can uh, recognize who they actually are. They're more responsive to beauty. And it's a very interesting kind of beauty because they uh, see the beauty uh, in what we would often take to be very ugly situations. Uh, and we often see this with profound painters who take um, people who are normally considered to be fairly ugly and then show just exactly how beautiful they really are. And then Maslow goes on to say, transcenders, I think, should be less afraid of nuts and cooks. If you're a transcender, you tend to be able to recognize which nuts are really nuts and which nuts are actually uh, transcendent. Uh, they're likely to be good selectors of creators who sometimes definitely look nutty and cookie. Uh, you know, the William Blake type, he's crazy on one level, you think. 
But if you have a greater experience with transcendence and you have a greater valuation of it, you can also distinguish between those who are genuine nuts and those who look nuts to a normal eye who's uneducated in these realms but can actually recognize their transcendence. So to try and consolidate this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through one of the people I think who's done this really well, who's given us a, a guiding story of how to go all the way from baby to sage. And, and that person I'm going to use is Ken Wilber. He's a, an American spiritualist um, who really has produced an interesting map of how education can take you all the way through the levels. And he's given accounts of all the different kinds of practices you need to reach these different levels. So I take him to be a profound educator. And we can start off with ourselves as an infant. And there, you really, when you are actually born, you really don't know that you have an inside or an outside. Your thumb and blanket are the same thing. But slowly but surely, you begin to work out that you have a physical self, that your actual physical self starts to hatch from the soup of existence. And you begin to realize that your toe is actually different uh, to uh, your blanket. Now... Even though your physical self has emerged, what's happened is your emotional self has not yet emerged properly. And what you feel, you feel the whole world feels. And you'll see this with babies. When one baby cries, other babies start to cry. It's not because they're in sympathy with other babies. It's because the world itself is crying and they're a part of the world and they cry. So your, your own emotions and your vital life feelings flood the world. When a baby cries, the world is crying. But between 15 and 24 months, you, you begin to get a grasp on your emotional self. You begin to get a sense that your, your emotional world is your own world and it's different to the world out there. And you begin to experience the birth and emergence of your psychological self. And you wake up, as Ken Wilber puts it, as a separate self in a separate world. Now, uh, what then happens around about the age of three, four, five is as you begin to work with language, you begin to develop a representational uh, mind. You enter a linguistic world with symbols and concepts, and they take on increasing importance. And you use symbols to start to describe the world. And around four years of age, you begin to grasp how concepts work. So really what happens at this uh, level is you begin to enter the symbolic world and it's here that education starts to play, formal education starts to play a bigger role, uh, starts to teach you how to read, write uh, and become numerate, working with symbols itself. Now, what's really interesting about this, and I've been a primary school teacher, is it's not only uh, learning uh, how to represent things, but what starts to happen to kids at primary school is they do have a sense of their physical, emotional and mental self, but they haven't fully worked out what their social self is, mainly because they've been really wrapped up uh, within a family structure. And what happens is when they begin to enter pre-primary and primary school, they begin to find out that there's a bigger social world with social rules and social norms, which are really important to get a grasp of, uh, that their view of the world is not the only view of the world. And, and the kids tend to shift from a situation where they're kind of doing their own thing to being absolutely desperate to kind of conform to the rules as they are. And it's really funny myself with my own daughter uh, holding me to account when I do things which I take to be post-conventional and she's like insistent that I stick to the rules uh, because that's what the rules say. Um, and she'll often use a teacher uh, to tell me why I'm wrong. And uh, I celebrate and support the process because I feel it's really important uh, when you're younger in primary school to develop a respect, admiration, uh, even a, a love for the way the rules actually operate. Because I trust and know that as the child develops, uh, they're going to go beyond a strict following of the rules. And really this begins to happen at high school. Uh, and I've taught at high school as well. And it's a really wonderful world to teach in. Because what happens is the, the children begin to think about thinking. Uh, uh, certainly in terms of their logic, 
they can do more than try out various concrete combinations of things on a table. They can begin to think of all the possible combinations in their heads and work from the possible set of combinations to the actual world. They don't have to keep on trying it out in practice. They can actually begin to think of what the possibilities are. And that means that possible worlds open out to uh, your imagination as well. And you start to judge those rules and roles which you followed so enthusiastically just a few years before. And you really start to criticize your parents, your teachers and your culture and you begin to embrace counter stances. You completely transform your identity and your look and you begin to experiment. And it's a wonderful world to actually be involved within as a teacher uh, because the children that you're working with are really open to the possible and see very critically the nature of the world that they're existing within. Um, and certainly uh, some of my best years have been involved uh, with teaching high school students. And the subjects I was involved in, by the way, were um, English history and life orientation, which are really interesting subjects to deal with these kinds of issues. The sixth phase uh, is described as vision logic. And really, firstly, I want to say that that this is the kind of logic which starts to operate around your matric year and as you enter into a university a tertiary kind of education. Uh, because really now you have a grasp of uh, abstract and alternative selves, but you haven't begun to put together how all these different possibilities, all these different possible worlds hold together in an integrated and holistic manner. So you're not only thinking about thinking, you're also thinking about all the patterns and the networks thrown up. And you have to now try and find your own authentic place within this massive set of possibilities. It's not enough just to be different. You have to now find how you are authentically you in this situation. Um, and really within the university structure, it becomes really important to work with these uh, vision logic levels where you start to show your students that it's not good enough for them just to understand what the different alternatives are. They have to synthesize those alternatives, number one. They have to see what possibilities there are for bringing them together. And then they have to work out what their own line authentically within it is and that is the exciting space you work in within university education and also at the higher levels of uh, secondary education high school now that's normally about where the story ends in terms of education if you've developed an authentic autonomous actualized person who uh, is committed to playing their role in the world in an effective and moral way, well, you've done your job as a teacher. And education really has done its job. But at this point, it's the same recognition which Maslow had, was that there are actually levels beyond that. And what I'd like to describe is three levels beyond that and talk to how education would work with these levels beyond actualization. And what starts to happen is when you have a realistic grasp of your triple A self, okay, you're authentic, you're autonomous, you're actualized, but you begin to sense that there's a new world behind that. And often you can have a, a peak experience. And by peak, I mean both a high, high level experience, but also a kind of a peak into the beyond. You get a glimpse. And it can often happen in terms of nature mysticism. You suddenly have a sense of the whole world becoming one. Uh, natural beauty intensifies, it becomes astonishing, uh, colors intensify, sounds and silence magnify, uh, you begin to sense the environment in, a, in a, an alive, uh, beautiful, vulnerable way, which makes you take on uh, your existence in the world in a far more profound and engaged way, because you have an extended sense, not only of beauty, but of suffering. And your sensitivity to the suffering means that you start to take on a more active role against people who are and situations which are perpetrating violence and damage on this world of ours. But from a, a, a level where you start to get a sense of um, a far more profound world, you can shift from that into a situation 
where you become sensitive to uh, more subtle energies and you begin to experience the energies in their own terms. Now, stay with me a little bit over here because what's happening is we are shifting into levels of uh, experience which are firstly quite controversial and secondly beyond the normal. But really what starts to happen is you begin to experience internal luminosities, sounds and thoughts and emotions which are of the state itself, not the state attached to an object. Okay, so if you have feelings of love and compassion, you have the feeling of love and compassion without thoughts of someone you love. You experience love in its own terms. You experience the force of love as a subtle energy. Uh, a, a Christian example might work here because uh, I think a lot of the people watching this video uh, will probably be Christians, although this definitely holds in a similar way across the other traditions. Uh, if you're a Christian, for example, you don't experience Christ as this man uh, with a beard and a white tunic coming towards you with a soulful but kind of still sexy smile. Um, you experience rather a flooding of pure love or grace that has a subtle uh, rather than a physical structure. Christ isn't a, a, a man um, in your imagination. You know him, in inverted commas, to be a force of love flooding through your system. And when you talk about it, you talk about it in terms of that subtle energy, that energy which is very difficult to grasp if you're living in the normal world. But once you shift into these higher levels of consciousness, you um, reach that kind of a level. Now, the final one which I'd, I'd like to talk about as a state is, is called uh, causal by Wilbur. And it's called causal because it's really the foundational state from which the other states spring. So you begin to be attracted to actual silence rather than what the silence enables you to experience, no matter how subtle, beautiful or profound the energy. So let me just kind of talk to that for a moment. When you experience a subtle energy, for example, something like uh, a love, What's happened is often to get to that subtle experience, you will have had to quiet yourself down to a point where you've stilled all your emotions and you've stilled all your thoughts and you've stilled your mind. You enter into a very meditative state. And it's in that state that you experience the subtle feeling of, of love uh, or various assorted other energies. But what happens is you start to be attracted to the empty opening or the clearing that allows that experience to actually emerge, that allows existence to dance. You start to stay in that emptiness, in that clearing in its own terms. And when this happens, the, the fullness of being hits you without any attachment or image or energy or name. It's just the experience of being, of, 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 of being, of the existence of this universe. In its own terms, the isness of being kind of hums as a vast kind of freedom. And you experience it in a very timeless, spaceless, objectless, creative ground from which everything springs. And that's why we kind of call it the causal level, because it's the state that allows other states to arise from it. And really what uh, I'm starting to point to is what would be the educational practices that we would work with to start to shift from uh, a vision logic where we're trying to actualize human beings into that transcendent space, that self-transcendent space Maslow discovered later on in his life, where we start to work with psychic, subtle and causal forces that start to get you into the profoundest heights of spirituality that human beings can actually reach and to not stop the educational process at the level of becoming uh, a rational and sorted human being, but also push education into the heights. And to do that, we have to start to take seriously the practices of yoga, the practices of prayer, and the practices of meditation that understand how these processes actually work.